Welcome everyone. I'm Liz Sylvan. I'm the Managing Director at the Bergman Klein Center, be her. And I am very honored to uh, welcome you to this talk today. Uh, before we get started, uh, for people uh, who are virtual today, you can use the Q&A um, function in Zoom to participate. We'd love for you to send any questions that you have for the panel. And uh, for folks in the room, you uh, the this uh, is being recorded. You are not being recorded in the room, just the speakers. But if you speak or say your name, that will be on the recording. Uh, so this is the third org fund uh, uh, colloquium on cybersecurity and cyber law. And we are very honored to have uh, Marta and her panel here. Um, before I talk about Marta's many accomplishments, I will want to just say a little bit about what we have come to know about Marta in the time that she's been a fellow with us. She is one of the um, seven 2023 BKT fellows. So um, when we were first reviewing applications for this fellowship, uh, Marta was interested in working on, um, inter on uh, education um, in multiple countries, including the Ukraine um, with US um, AID. And we were impressed with her policy background, her legal background, and I was also really impressed with how she thought about learning um, and the perspective that she brought to that. That was not what you would typically find uh, for policymakers. Um, she would have applied um, about two years ago, a little bit more than that. By the time uh, we were reviewing the applications, um, the invasion of Ukraine had already happened. And uh, when Becca Tabaski, who's sitting over there, and I interviewed Amarta, she was not in her home city. She was in a dark space in somebody else's home with the lights and internet going on and off, having to periodically evacuate um, due to bombing, and was really considering how this would impact her work, um, and was thinking perhaps she might want to uh, work for a tribunal court, which is also with, very much within her capacity, um, one of the many dimensions of her, her capabilities. Um, it was a really trying moment uh, for Marta, and it's as it has been for all of the people in Ukraine and for people all over the world who go through these kinds of situations. By the time Marta came to us, um, we were honored to have her in our presence, and she had already rethought what she wanted to do and has had this time in the fellowship to um, reflect on how she can reconnect with what she wanted to do originally and build it beyond her original conception. And we are very grateful to be able to see this growth path and to have her as a member of our community. So um, I'm also gonna tell you about her official accomplishments, um, which is a legal expert with an extensive background in judicial and public sector reform in the Ukraine. She has supported state institutions, civil society, and international organizations to improve the quality of governance, including and through integration of technology and digital school uh, tools, uh, including things for schools. Um, so, um, her work now really is focused not only on education, but on uh, human development for the rebuilding of Ukraine and um, also conceiving how this might impact work uh, across the EU and beyond. And um, so with that, uh, I hand it over to you, Martha, and to your panel. Thank you so very much, Yuri. It's a real honor for me to be part of this community. And I'm very, very grateful to everyone who is here today and participating. Hopefully you will participate and ask questions today as well. Um, I had the privilege to work with today's distinguished speakers on two major reforms in Ukraine, one of them on law enforcement, the other one on judicial. And I believe that those reforms had actually helped Ukraine in building its uh, capacity and resilience to with, uh, withstand security uh, threats, including state um, 
sponsored cyber attacks. Over the years, we've seen that cyber attacks um, have increased in their sophistication and complexity. And uh, what we questioned and what we thought we knew before February 2022, unfortunately came to reality with the full-scale invasion of Russia. Uh, they used internet and uh, other computer network as an additional weapon to first disrupt the work of state and local institutions. They wanted to spread this information. They wanted to sow mistrust. And they also ended up destroying first targeting and then damaging critical infrastructure that put all of our lives in, in great danger. So I want to make it very clear that cyber attacks now are not just an attacks of machines on machines, but they are intended on people and they can harm people. Uh, as a citizen, I really felt the impact as you have already mentioned. And uh, what the other feature that I feel like we all need to understand of the current cyber attacks is that they expanded to many, many targets. Russia started from targeting first state and local institutions. Then they spread to all types of critical infrastructure and utilities, including electrical grid, supply, uh, water supply systems, heating systems. And then they spread to all individuals and businesses of all sizes, even logistics and humanitarian organizations. So I would say no one is immune anymore, and we have to understand that. I had a conversation with the representative of Cybersecurity Department of State Security Service of Ukraine, and only this institution alone uh, last year countered more than 4,500 cyber attacks and incidents. And unfortunately, most, if not all, of those cyber attacks have been complemented by, they have complemented kinetic military actions, which again, made put all of our lives in, in, in really uh, great danger. Uh, with the cyber attacks, um, I think the other factor that is different from what it used to be is that Russia is now complementing them with sophisticated information influence campaigns that include disinformation and uh, propaganda. And their intention is to target not just people in Ukraine or in Russia, but outside of Ukraine globally. They want to shift their opinions about the reality. They want to sow mistrust again. They want to polarize the societies. And then they want to threaten democratic societal processes in different countries, not just in Ukraine. And unfortunately, when we look at the actions of um, Russian Federation, um, many other autocratic governments, including in China, uh, North Korea, Iran, they are emboldened by the actions that have been conducted by Russians. And they are now targeting not just Ukraine, but other countries, including the United States. And I've seen reports from Microsoft, Amazon, Cisco, which basically are now reporting about great danger to other countries, democratic processes. So I want to make it very clear that from now on, we don't pose the question of if, it's the question of when and then how, how we resist, how we respond, and how we recover. Um, when we think about cyber attacks, I want all of us to, um, to think about the irony of them, because on, on the one hand, they represent, they may represent a successful cyber incident of an attacker, but once identified, they also provide an opportunity for a defender to spot techniques, to spot tactics, and then procedures that will help us to identify it and then thwart the ongoing and hopefully future cyber attacks as well. And today's event, I actually want all of us to uh, focus on um, significant efforts that Ukraine has made together with the incredible support of its partners. And I want us to think about the lessons we can adopt ourselves in our communities, in our organizations to be better prepare, prepared for and to be able to respond to cyber attacks that unfortunately exist today. Um, just briefly, I want this conversation to be as much conversational and useful for you as possible. So there will be after presentations Q&A session. Please use the opportunity to ask questions. Um, with that, I am delighted to introduce the first um, distinguished speaker 
Dr. Robert Peacock, who is DAI Global Senior Technical Advisor in Cybersecurity to USA's Europe and Eurasia Bureau's Critical Infrastructure Digitalization and Resilience Program to support cybersecurity across 12 countries in Central and Eastern Europe. He also teaches in the Department of Criminology and Criminal Justice and the Global Affairs Program at Florida International University. And he spent more than 15 last years uh, managing overseas training and assistance programs funded by the U.S. Department of State, Department of Justice, and the Department of Homeland Security. Over to you, Rob. Thank, you. Uh, thank you very much for that kind introduction, Marta. Let me uh, share my screen here. I don't know why it's moving on me. <laughs> I got it. Uh, it's good. Okay. So again, I'd like to uh, not only thank Marta, uh, but also the Berkman Klein Center for inviting me today and the great job Liz and Zia has been doing to putting this together. And uh, I, as you can see from the Slide behind me. Uh, you want to share it to the file, don't you? I knew I made a mistake. <laughs> Zia's always there, though, saving me. So, uh, what I want to emphasize with the title of this, uh, and I'm going to share two lessons which I think are relevant to the United States and, in fact, the wider globe from the first year of cyber war. And I'm saying that very purposely, first year of cyber war, because for two decades, there's always been an asterisk for anyone studying, researching, or discussing cyber war. And that asterisk was, this of course is hypothetical. We don't in fact know what a cyber war would look like. We don't know the parameters of a cyber war. We've never had a cyber war. And what I would like to argue is that um, Uh, what I would like to argue is that we are now in the midst of a cyber war. We have two countries with uh, top 10 in the world IT industries and workforces at all out war. And they are using cyber offensive weapons that uh, have never been used in conflict before. But regardless of how you fall out on that, uh, because it has been debated, I should point out that there's a subject you know, since 2014, what existed in Ukraine, it was a limited kinetic war, right? I was there in 2014 with my family when Crimea was first um, uh, taken and then special forces moved into the Donbass region from Russia. But over the subsequent eight years, there was what, without a doubt, was a limited kinetic war. So the debate was, well, is this, on? all-out cyber war or not. And that has been debated uh, throughout those eight years, but before getting to that, I do want to emphasize that over those eight years, there were unprecedented cyber attacks. I think many in the room are familiar with a couple of them, but I do want to go over them uh, leading up into my discussion. Uh, the first was in 2015, when the Russian military intelligence unit by the name of Sandworm created something, uh, malware named the uh, Indestroyer, and they took advantage of substations in the, on the electrical grid of Ukraine, which were in the midst of a pilot program. Ukraine wanted to connect their grid to the EU, which was done uh, this immediately after the invasion, but they had been spending several years to do so. And the first step, was a pilot in Western Ukraine where they had to digitalize for the first time, but the EU hadn't yet funded the cybersecurity stage of that pilot. And when Indestroyer arrived, it did knock out uh, uh, substations in Ukraine for a half a day. And that is today the most studied uh, attack on a physical system. So here we're talking about OT. So this great dread we have that <coughs> Uh, besides affecting information systems, 
that a cyber attack could penetrate and actually do harm to the actual machine tools, the actual operational technology in a firm. And this is the course, every SCADA course in America, every electrical engineering program in the country, this is the most debated and discussed purely cyber attack. Now, there are some cases around the world where a USB and an insider did great harm, but this is the most studied uh, SCADA attack. The other famous, uh, uh, or infamous, if you will, cyber attack was in 2017 when uh, NotPetya was uh, wreaking havoc, not only in Ukraine, but in the outside world. So it's uh, well known in this case. Uh, this was a wiperware that was distributed. And I was also in Ukraine at the time. Uh, and in Ukraine, the, the main attack was through point-of-sale terminals. A Russian firm had, uh, had a monopoly on point-of-sale software across Ukraine for many years. And even though it was now an affiliate, they had managed to uh, put the malware across the uh, network of, of point-of-sale terminals to the point where I was trying to get gasoline, uh, taking my daughter to practice, and we went to three straight gas stations, and there was just bricked terminals. They didn't know what to do. They, didn't, they couldn't make a sale. It was psychologically very damaging, without a doubt. And not that she is largely seen as the greatest economic impact of a cyber attack, more than $10 billion worldwide. Um, the UK health system had a system that was so antiquated that the producer of their, the actual vendor who provided their network software had gone out of business years before. So it was going into the ransomware era in a very vulnerable state. And sure enough, it was one of the biggest victims of the not Petya virus. But those two, uh, those two attacks, though unprecedented, it was difficult to argue uh, and was much debated whether this was all out cyber war. Was Russia holding back? Did they have red lines? Well, now here it is in 2023, and we've got dozens of war crimes. A, a Russian state that decides to send a smart weapon from a plane to destroy a theater in Mariupol, which I've chosen here as my picture on my slide. This was a decision made despite months of advertising that those were children in there, that they were Russian, primarily Russian-speaking refugees from the city of Mariupol, huddled in that theater. And yet, a decision was made to blow it up. And so it's very difficult today for someone to make the argument, well, Russia may be holding back. Maybe they're a little uh, uncertain of whether they want to take a particular cyber offensive uh, technology that we're unfamiliar with, something that they uh, could be, uh, they could choose uh, to add to the ongoing conflict. Today, it is largely assumed that Russia is at an all-out cyber uh, war, committing all-out cyber war, uh, along with their conventional war. But regardless of your view on that, uh, most definitely in February 2022, the Kremlin made a clear decision that they were going to increase the cyber attack as part of their invasion uh, into greater Ukraine, which took place, as you know, uh, a little more than a year ago. And that definitely included an increase in cyber activity. So there were two to three times higher DDoS, or these are denial of service attacks, the sort of thing that bring down websites. And in the case of Kiev Star, the largest mobile phone company in Ukraine, uh, a record two terabyte per second DDoS attack took place. Actually, it's a little shy of the record. There was a attack in Asia on Microsoft Azure that was a little higher, but it clearly demonstrates the high volume that uh, the high volume of the attacks that Russia was willing to uh, uh, to commit with the start of their land invasion. So, as far as other indications that were at a state of greater cyber war. They also set aside uh, a particular malware that was specifically aimed at the device you see pictured here. Uh, the plane I took from Miami to here uh, had a nice Viasat logo on the side of the plane because they are the main provider of 
uh, Wi-Fi if you fly a plane, if you're on Air Force One, U.S. Special Forces, anyone outside the traditional uh, uh, map of, of, of the World Wide Web, such as uh, offshore oil platforms, they all tend to use Biosat. And over the first eight years of the conflict in Ukraine, the Ukrainian military also used Biosat as their backup for internet hotspots. And on the, in the week of the invasion, uh, Mellor shut down brick 22,000 of these modems across the world. Now, very few of them, relatively speaking, were in Ukraine. But clearly, this was an attack that was a decision on the part of the Kremlin that they would increase uh, and make use of something they've been saving up over time uh, in order to increase the pressure on Ukraine from a cyber attack. Nonetheless, Ukraine has proved resilient to these attacks. Um, in particular, I, I always use these presentations. I always include a photo of a cable guy because uh, what's much overlooked is the fact that it's the sacrifice, particularly lives lost, of Ukrainians who are continuing to keep up their main source of data transmission, which is the cable guy and which is the uh, wireless tower workers, including in the combat zone. You might not know that reading U.S. newspapers because we have a very popular American who has his own business providing backup internet hotspots in Ukraine. Uh, and that comes into a very important third place in the importance of uh, data transmission in Ukraine. Uh, but I, I want to emphasize that this resilience of, the, in, of Ukraine uh, can also be demonstrated in terms of the actual security breaches over the year of war. So I'm using data from Nord Security. Nord Security is the largest VPN provider in the former Soviet region. It's based out of Vilnius, but they are pretty good with statistics in this region that is, again, otherwise very difficult to monitor. And they report that over the last year of war, there's been a decline in the number of security breaches in Ukraine. Uh, by comparison, there's been a, a considerable up increase in security breaches inside Russia. So I give this uh, first half of my presentation to really kind of set the table about this concept of Ukrainian resilience, which is pretty commonly the position held across uh, the cybersecurity community in America as well. And I want to reflect on what are the lessons to the United States and to other countries from the resilience in the face of an all-out cyber attack. Again, unprecedented in uh, history. So the first of those is the topic of supported network software, or the opposite of supported network software, which would be pirated software, or software that simply isn't maintaining its uh, connection to the vendor so that they can be patched <coughs> and so forth. And this is particularly important in the global south. And this was very much true in Ukraine. So in 2017, I just, I talked about this now Petya attack, right? 2017 had a huge impact across Ukraine. And at that time, Triple SCIP, which is, you know, besides um, stopping a lot, of, uh, a lot of cybersecurity attacks, they, they use more constants than anyone else in their, <laughs> in their uh, nomenclature, but the triple S CIP is responsible for cybersecurity for the government agencies in Ukraine, and since the war started, private sector as well. And triple S CIP in 2017 reported that as much as 80% of network software in the public and private sectors was unsupported. Either it was pirated or it was uh, Simply, as often the case, when you have a systemically corrupt country, you often have, well, the most profitable position is often the IT administrator. You're responsible for buying millions of dollars of thin air. The accountants come, and they can prove nothing if you pay retail price for a pirated piece of software. It, the, the rest of the company, the rest of the ministry, it's without a doubt the most profitable part of any ministry in, in when it comes to procurement. And in particular, public procurement corruption 
what it tends to do is it incentivizes the wrong behavior. So I worked for several years in Ukraine. Uh, department, I managed the Department of Justice Law Enforcement Project Office, and we would, on occasion, try to support IT, even though we knew it was the, the wrong side of the track to try to accomplish something. But we often say, for example, we wanted to support a trafficking persons unit, in a, a new trafficking persons unit. We wanted to create a separate, off the stolen and, un and, and unfortunately untrustworthy main network. So we wanted to buy hardware, software, and establish this for 10 or 12 analysts. And we would come and they would look at us and say, you got a nice proposal, but our boss says we buy Oracle or nothing. I said, what, uh, Oracle? You're not a, you don't have 500 employees. Why would, we buy, why would we spend this money? And they would say, we walk or, or Oracle. And it's for simple reason, because it costs them a tremendous amount of money up front huge kickbacks. Yes, you'll never be able to pay the license fee the next year or the next year, but if you're the corrupt IT administrator, you don't care. And even at the time we're discussing it, I don't mean to pick on Oracle, who are doing good things in Ukraine right now. Uh, but at that time, Oracle would say, well, we're not even selling right now anyways, because no one in this country is paying the license fees afterwards. Because of course, there's no, there's no rents to be made. There's no corruption you can gain from paying the, maintaining the license, maintaining their relationship with that vendor. And this is true across the global side. And so what I would like to point out in terms of Ukraine's resilience is this little laptop right here and e-auction procurement site known as Prozoro. And Prozoro, which actually was started because it takes a long time to set up a public-private venture that would replace all government procurement. So in Ukraine now, the only way a government ministry can buy anything is through this independently operated it's private sector, public sector uh, combination of a committee funded initially by the Council of Europe years ago, but now every donor has pretty much uh, added to it. The, the, uh, the UN actually uses it for their own pr procurement now in country because they don't trust, their, they trust it more than their own internal system. And this Prozoro, which became essentially operational you know, on a large scale in approximately 2017, approximately the time of NAPETCHA. And over those five years since, it's had a tremendous impact on, on the procurement of IT in Ukraine. So earlier I mentioned that 80% of the networks were, were, were unprotected software. Today, well, let's let's more accurately say in February 2022, triple SCIP estimates that the ratio had, had actually flipped, that now 20% of the network at that time, at the time you, that, that um, Russia launched, not only did it launch an in destroyer two at the time of its invasion, it's already tried 12 different uh, wiperware that were modeled after not Petya. And this time, however, they were going into a very different place, a place where 80% of networks, public and private, were now uh, not pirated, but actually had a, a licensed relationship with the vendor, were actually regularly patched, and were far less vulnerable, as has been demonstrated by the Ukrainian resilience. And this is a lesson, I think, and quite honestly, this is one of my main research interests, which is the overall Global South vulnerability to cybersecurity, something that's largely overlooked and, and, uh, globally, at least until last year. 2022, in many ways, was the year of the Global South when it comes to ransomware attacks. So this is just a list of successful ransomware attacks in governments around the world. And these are the governments who admit it. Two months ago, the Department of Justice took down one of the important, one of the larger uh, ransomware uh, organizations called the Hive, and they managed to secure all their servers. And examining the Hive, they found, because they were able to literally determine exactly who paid ransoms across the world, and they found that less than 20% of those who paid ransoms ever even admitted to being attacked, nevertheless 
being ransomed and paying a ransom. And that number is even lower in the global south, I would argue. So to finish this first lesson, um, I would argue that in many ways, it's been a perfect storm in the global south. They lead the world today in a portion of digitalization. They are rapidly becoming digitalized uh, over the last few years in particular. But from the ransomware perspective, they have a preference to pay. So think, think if, you're, if you're a corrupt IT administrator sitting over a ministry in an um, impoverished country with systemic corruption. If, you're now, if you've just gotten attacked and, and much of your data is locked up, you have a choice. You can turn a new leaf over and become an honest, and I'm going to, from now on, only have uh, you know, legitimate software on my system, and I'm going to pursue a new course. Or you're going to say, well, that corrupt ransomer, he wants me to pay him. We quietly get this all resolved, and I continue with the status quo. Which do you think they choose? Are they going to choose the tact of paying quietly, and, and, and no one knows better? Or are they going to try and, and, uh, and, and, and actually strengthen the country? And so as a last point on this, and this is, again, more personal, um, uh, my trying to uh, turn attention to my own writing, but uh, I have a, I have an article coming out at Third World Quarterly in the next few months, which specifically examined the national cybersecurity strategies from the global south. At least the 30 that are available electronically. And of those 30, and I also threw in the North American and the European uh, strategies as well. But in all those strategies, there's not one reference to the word corruption. Not one asterisk, not one footnote. And I would argue in a, that, at least it's my personal opinion, that public corruption is the single most, the single strongest, the single most influential element undermining cybersecurity in the global south. Uh, and, and yet, it's still largely overlooked both by the donor community and uh, the countries themselves. So that's the first lesson. I wanted to kind of take a global south perspective. Now I'd like to turn more for a US uh, perspective. Um, and that has to do with the role of the network software vendors in Ukraine since the war started. And this has really been a, a surprise as well. And clearly part of the Ukrainian resilience, uh, unarguably, a major part of Ukrainian resilience is the surprise of the, particularly the big three. So by big three, I mean Oracle, Microsoft, Cisco. They, since day one, have moved entire threat intelligence centers into Ukraine. They are operating on the front line of the cyber war. And this is something that no one could have predicted. They are literally you know, in the process of, of both scanning, identifying, and patching those vulnerabilities on their software in the country of Ukraine. Because of course, part of it is they don't want to be victims themselves. They understand the next top petya also impacts them globally if it's aimed at their particular weaknesses, vulnerabilities. And so, as the, in the last part of my presentation, I would like to make the case that this role, so if you're in Washington, right? So if you're Kemba Walden, right? Kemba Walden, National Director of Cybersecurity for the United States in the White House. And you're saying, you're looking and you're seeing the major producers of network software, they're on the front line in Ukraine. But where are they in the United States? Where are they on the cybersecurity uh, struggle in the United States? And I argue that this past year, has had a tremendous influence on the decision, as demonstrated a few weeks ago when the 2023 National Cybersecurity Strategy came out, that they are going to make a major shift, a fundamental shift, in how we, the United States, regulate cybersecurity within our IT and OT industries. And by that, I'm particularly referring to the perception on the part of policymakers that the last decade of carrot approach, we have a voluntary 
approach to cybersecurity when it comes to uh, makers of, of software and, 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 and solutions across the ITOT industry. Their view is that we failed to one, incentivize security at conception, right? Security by design is the popular term now. Uh, we failed to achieve that through the current approach. Two, that approach has created a structure in which the most important agents, the most important firms dealing with cybersecurity are small boutiques do after sale activities versus the actual companies that are best positioned and most capable of reducing vulnerabilities in our network software, which is the producers and programmers of said software. So I really believe, and I wanted to finish this uh, presentation by making an analogy. An analogy to, well, this gentleman, by the way, a Harvard Law grad, Ralph Nader, uh, something this gentleman led in 1966, which was another industry which was failing to design safety within. So in 1966, at the time that, that Ralph Nader wrote his book, and, and, and this is him testifying before Congress, but at the time there were no seatbelts available in U.S. automobiles, despite the fact that a small boutique in Wisconsin had invented it three decades before and actually made good money selling that to some aftermarket uh, auto owners who wanted a seatbelt and, and, and didn't want to go to Scandinavia to buy their car. There were no bumper tests. And a year later, in 1967, Congress completely altered the universe when it comes to how we interpret safety in the auto industry by creating the National Highway Transportation Administration. And so what I would like to finish making a further analogy, if I can go even further down the analogy rabbit hole, um, I would suggest that the seatbelt is in many ways analogous to today's debate over dual authorization. So all of you are aware of dual authorization when your bank suddenly says, you know, you've got to get a second, uh, besides entering your password, you have to be authorized by a second device. But I was just thinking about, this analogy came to me a few months now, I guess, when I was at a cybersecurity insurance panel, and the panel before me had uh, CISOs, these are the chief of information security of organizations, and this panel of CISOs, they were arguing against insurance industry in particular wants to push these companies to have dual authorization. And one CISO said, I can't even spell dual authorization, but our customers don't want it, elderly struggle with it, it's too costly, and this is not something that should be uh, forced by the government on us. And I thought this is so unparalleled to what you could find in 1966, when the Ford company said only 2% of our customers, we just did a survey, only 2% of our customers want seatbelts to even be in their car, and nevertheless use them. A radio DJ got 40,000 people on the street protesting against seatbelts. They said it was too costly. The elderly would struggle with it. Our customers don't want it. Do not force seatbelts on us. And so as we enter 2024, I truly believe that many of the uh, folks here in Cambridge, uh, obviously our Congress, but uh, Cameron Walden, and this is also the head of uh, the leads for current, uh, for federal security at DHS, at State Department, at DOJ, all appearing at a Atlanta Council event a few weeks ago, but I believe that they will be part of a transition towards a new approach, a carrot and stick approach towards getting what is taking place in Ukraine. The actual vendors and solution providers being on the front line and being the lead in cybersecurity. So thank you very much. I believe we'll take one question. Yes, I would first thank you so much a wonderful presentation. Um, I already mentioned that we will have Q&A, but I also think it's better to make sure that if anyone has a question, we will follow up immediately after the presentation. I will start with a quick question on uh, cyber resilience. Um, you pointed, you mentioned on the importance of implementing 
sorry, I hope you can hear me, on implementing anti-corruption measures. And uh, thank you for mentioning Prozoro procurement platform that has become one of the success um, stories in Ukraine. But uh, can you, if I'm wondering, do you uh, have any other uh, measures on capacity building in mind that have proven to be effective in Ukraine and that other countries have already <coughs> adopted? And you mentioned the experience of the United States. We also, we also, I am so sorry for that. <laughs> Hear me now. Okay. They also presented their new national cybersecurity strategy, so I was just wondering whether they have been inspired and adopted any capacity building measures based on Ukraine's experience. And, <clears throat> sorry. I, uh, I brought uh, the uh, allergies from Miami. Unfortunately, <laughs> we're experiencing the, head of, the heat of uh, allergy season, and for a person who's allergic to palm, <laughs> uh, I, I'm moving to DC, so it'll soon be over. But uh, my voice uh, seems a little sparse. I'm, I apologize. But uh, most definitely, I mean, uh, there's a framework. I, th I personally think workforce is the biggest problem, not just in Ukraine, but worldwide. I mean, there's not a country in the world that workforce for cybersecurity isn't a major urgent concern. And in Ukraine, They've adopted what's known as the NICE framework here. So my university, Florida International University, we're responsible for all training and the conferences that the Department of Commerce, NIST, you're probably all familiar with the, the fact that we have this Institute for Standards called NIST at Commerce. And under there, there's a workforce framework called NICE. And NICE, uh, fortunately, uh, the one person doing it, she, Karen Russell has been uh, uh, the one-man show for five years now, but she's finally getting to hire six or seven other people. Uh, but she has been leading an effort to um, basically change how both universities and those who hire cybersecurity graduates uh, interact in trying to develop a common language, not based on degrees and subjects, not based on exact positions, but based on skills and how can the two meet to make sure graduates have the skills needed and that, uh, that the industry uh, also has the ability to, um, to work with them and, 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 and cooperate in providing practical skills. But this, um, this is something that is most definitely, I can say in four countries now, there's a, a version of NICE framework or the EU in October created their own, their own uh, workforce framework. I believe uh, theirs is um, the skills framework, but um, but they are in the process of, of creating uh, a similar environment. Uh, my main concern, as far as donors, is that there's a there's a tendency to look towards computer engineering alone, and uh, as Miter recently put out, well, not that long ago, put out a study. Uh, and advocated for the idea that our future cybersecurity workforce, more than half, will only have two years or less of education, higher education. And we have to keep in mind that cybersecurity, uh, I always compare it, being a law enforcement guy at DOJ, I always compare it to uh, law schools producing future policemen. Uh, uh, the future police, some undoubtedly come out of law schools, and we were successful in Ukraine in convincing many, but, but for the most part, it's not the ideal match. And cybersecurity in many ways is the police of the IT and OT world. And the computer engineering alone can't be the, the focus. We have to also focus on, on apprentice programs. It's something that uh, Purdue and my university is working on under Department of Labor grants. But trying to take those people, for example, in a, if you're in, a, in, a, in an impoverished country uh, trying to uh, get critical infrastructure to have cybersecurity personnel, say at a dam in the middle of nowhere in a village. And I'm using a, I can't mention the country. Um, I'm kind of limited in what I can say with the programs I work on. But I know of a dam that's in a village of about 600 people, and they need cybersecurity personnel. Well, guess what? The, the top 10 students in the country who went to the prestigious computer engineering program to get a, a, their graduate degrees, they're not going to that village. They want to be the next you know, Musk. They don't want to be necessarily sitting and administrating a dam's 
IT infrastructure for the next two years? The answer comes with how do we get some of the 600 that live in that village to actually be cybersecurity competent in terms of the basic functions? Um, so, so that's what I think we're going to hopefully move towards. Uh, but we are doing a great deal um, in terms of uh, getting the universities uh, to match the, um, the needs of, of, of the workforce in cybersecurity. Thank you so much. Um, just to check, Sia, do we have time for another question? Okay. Uh, I'm sorry, but we will have a Q&A session and I will provide uh, an opportunity to, to, for you to ask questions. But I would like to now push over to another distinguished uh, speaker with whom I also had an honor to work together. Uh, he is Dr. Pavel Fushkar. Um, he is the head of division at the Department for the Execution of Judgments of the European Court of Human Rights uh, of the Directorate General of Human Rights and the Rule of Law of the Council of Europe. He has been working at the Council of Europe for over 20 years and before that he worked at the registry um, of the European Court of Human Rights as a senior lawyer. And before joining the Council of Europe, he worked as an attorney and as a public official at the Supreme Court of Ukraine. And today he will talk more about the Council of Europe's role in promoting cybersecurity cooperation and also will give us more insights as to the measures that are recommended by the Council of Europe. The floor is yours, Paolo. Yes, uh, thank you so much, Marta. I hope you can hear me well. Uh, I think it's lunchtime in, uh, in the United States and Harvard, but it's an evening in Strasbourg and we are getting close to the dark hours of the day. So I will try to present the ideas that you have asked me about in a brief fashion and I have prepared a little presentation uh, on this. But first of all, um, dear Professor Peacock, dear Madam Chair, Ms. Basistuk, dear participants, dear colleagues, it's a great pleasure to be here and to share with you some ideas on the current cyber threats and challenges that uh, we face from the point of view of international law uh, and as well as uh, challenges from the point of view of respect for human rights and the rule of law that the uh, current uh, cyber threats uh, are, are leading to. So um, I would like to thank again Marta and uh, Robert as well as Sia for inviting me to take part in this event and to speak about several suggested topics. Just before I switch to the presentation, I think a couple of words of importance um, about the Council of Europe and a couple of words of, about the organization that I come from. So as Marta has said, I'm currently employed at the Council of Europe, which is an international organization composed of 46 member states. It is operating on the basis of three pillars of activities, and these are human rights, democracy, and rule of law. It is one of the eldest international organizations on the European continent, and it is obviously different from European Union, uh, which has now membership of 27 member states. The organization's activities are based on the establishment, promotion, monitoring of common European standards in the areas of three pillars of its operation, which I have referred to before, which are human rights, democracy, and the rule of law. Now, in my uh, professional experience at the Council of Europe, I used to work at the registry of the European Court of Human Rights, and my work was related to processing mostly individual complaints that are lodged uh, by uh, individuals against the states raising allegations of human rights violations. And since 2016, I've been working for the Department for the Execution of Judgments of the European Court of Human Rights, which is uh, a department providing legal advice to the Committee of Ministers of the Council of Europe that is a statutory body composed of uh, ministers and deputy ministers of the member states of the Council of Europe that supervise compliance with the obligations to execute judgments of the European Court of Human Rights. Just briefly about the execution of judgments requirements, because I will touch upon it to a certain extent, but mostly I will focus on cybersecurity issues. So if we look into uh, what is being done as regards execution of judgments, the requirements of execution measures vary from rights concerned and the types of measures to be taken. 
So thus, each judgment of the European Court of Human Rights requires the respondent states, in case of a negative judgment against them, to undertake individual and general measures aimed at ensuring restoration of the situation that existed before the breach occurred, cessation of the ongoing breaches, and providing guarantees of non-repetition. I think these three elements will reappear in our discussion today about cyber threats and international law. So, but as a result of Strasbourg court judgments, uh, we see that some states managed to introduce a number of uh, real important changes into the domestic systems, including the changes to the constitutions, laws or practices, synchronizing themselves with the requirements of human rights contained in the European Convention on Human Rights. So my work also um, at the Council of Europe concerns uh, providing advice to my hierarchy on various issues uh, related to human rights uh, protection. And that also concerns the work uh, of the task force of the Secretary General of the Council of Europe on freedom of exp expression, as well as the work on matters of accountability for gross and serious human rights violations. And that's that's actually very much related to our discussion today on cyber threats and cyber warfare and, and the damage caused by cyber warfare as regards Ukraine. I will speak today in my individual capacity rather than an academic and legal researcher, but uh, that's now I will try to switch to the presentation that I have and actually will try to share the slides that I have in my possession. So I hope you can see the slides and I will try to walk through these slides with you and starting from the first um, slide where I would like to suggest the topics that I will cover today. I'm losing using actually less uh, visuals in comparison with Robert. My apologies for that. So I hope the text is still suitable for the audience and that it's not uh, the slides are not overcharged with text. But there are five main elements that I wanted to cover today. Actually, the elements relating to international legal framework as regards the cybercrime, cybersecurity, and cyber warfare. The Council of Europe Budapest Convention and the protocols there too is one of the key uh, legal instruments dealing with issues of uh, cybercrime. Also, I will touch upon from the point of view of um, dealing uh, the with cyber threats uh, the some with some elements related to the right to privacy and right of access to internet uh, to information in the cyberspace i will also touch upon investigation prosecution and judicial examination of cases concerning cyber crime and also cyber warfare and will also cover a little bit ukraine and then issues related to collection and retention of data versus national security threats and protection of public order and morals and we'll try to come on the basis of this discussion with some conclusions as to potential future uh, for international legal framework based on the gaps that can be easily identified from this discussion so i think in the first place what i would suggest is actually the discussion on the state of international law facing the cyber threats and uh, cyber security issues. The second is the role of the Council of Europe in counteracting these threats and its key instrument, the Budapest Convention, as well as then the potential response of international law to the above mentioned cyber threats, cyber security, and cyber warfare. And then the issue of accountability will be kind of one of the final elements that I would tend to discuss. To be frank, I didn't really foresee initially covering the issues of cyber warfare. Robert has already touched upon it. Uh, but actually, based on the materials that you find when you research this topic, you cannot avoid speaking about cyber warfare. Um, I think the discussion on cyber warfare that is now happening in the academic 
uh, circles and in the public is very much allowing us to look into the future of regulating uh, cyberspace as well. Cyber threats coming from cyber warfare. And also it allows us to foresee on how responsibility for unlawful or illegal use of information technologies, cyber activities, not only by individuals, non-public entities, but also by the states, how this accountability could be established. In this sense, cyber warfare as a product of states' ex external activity, usually military, its machinery poses unique questions from the point of view of international law approaches to responsibility and attributability of conduct amounting to cyber warfare to states themselves. Even though we see that in many instances, the cyber warfare is being conducted by subjects that do not necessarily belong to the state uh, authority. And in some states, on the contrary, we see that these activities are heavily centralized with the state. So in addition to the issues of cyber warfare, I think one cannot omit but to speak at least briefly about the most recent technological advancements in the area of IT, the artificial intelligence, even the famous uh, chats that are being created now and their potential unethical or illegal use if also uh, to the extent that these could be considered uh, um, amounting to cyber criminality. Also, the use of IT and cyberspace for operations amounting to disinformation and misinformation, something that was mentioned by Marta, pose particular issues from the point of view of freedom of expression and access to information. And finally, an element of importance in all of these discussions that I find extremely uh, interesting to explore is a public-private collaboration in the area of information technologies and the issues of implications of such collaborations on protection of human rights and the rule of law. So going to the first slide, I think one can definitely say that international law is increasingly being called upon to develop new forms of international response uh, in order to anticipate, assess, minimize, and mitigate the risks posed by emerging uh, on novel technologies, including by the risks of use of these technologies by the states that act illegally. Uh, indeed, uh, information technologies pose new challenges to international law. And there are even definitions that exist now that probably partly cover the elements of our discussion because new developments uh, rapidly emerge and it is rather difficult to define and to uh, actually to assess these new developments uh, from the point of view of the legal construction. Also, the difficulties that arise from the cyber criminality that generally relate to uh, definitions, they don't only extend to, to, to the issue of defining what is illegal, but they also extend to complexities of cross-border cooperation and jurisdictional issues uh, that, that focus on evidence gathering and admissibility of such evidence uh, from the point of view of legal proceedings. So indeed, uh, there are many elements that I mentioned here that already from the point of view of their definitions, they probably lack sufficient precision, just as the elements I list here, the cyber threats, cyber attacks, cyber security, cyber crime, cyber warfare, because indeed these are just tools uh, that are used for illegal purposes. And uh, I think essentially the legal framework we have in international law is rather focused on the domain not of international law as such, but regulating cyber crime and counteracting cyber criminality through the means of transnational criminal law, being rather based on prosecution of such crimes via national jurisdictions, rather than having a single unified sort of uh, approach uh, to some of the uh, international uh, crimes 
through a unique system of international law enforcement. If we look at the uh, Budapest Convention itself, that is a key legal instrument uh, from uh, the point of view of the activities of the Council of Europe, but it can be said also that it's an important legal instrument, an instrument of universal importance from the point of view of international law. The Council of Europe Budapest Convention has indeed uh, evolved into not only an important legal document, but it has evolved into a framework that permits hundreds of practitioners from the state parties to the Budapest Convention to share experience and create relationship that facilitate cooperation in specific cases, uh, emergency situations, beyond the specific uh, provisions uh, of this convention. Budapest Convention, in this sense, it's a treaty that has produced significant effects, not only from, uh, for the uh, Council of Europe member states, and you can see that I'm mentioning here 68 member states to that convention, but it has also um, invited some 20 more states to accede uh, to uh, this treaty. It covers such issues as uh, definition of substantive offenses under under its provisions. So um, access offenses, use offenses, and contact offenses are covered by the provisions of Budapest Convention. But it also provides rather, rather largely for harmonization of domestic criminal law, procedural rules governing cybercrime prosecution, and uh, it provides for a specific international cooperation regime. Indeed, um, within the framework of this uh, convention, expert bodies of the Budapest Convention produce uh, an enormous amount of expertise in the area of counteracting cyber crime and cyber threats. For instance, they produce an extensive set of guidelines notes uh, to state parties and other interested states on various issues of cybersecurity. Already a dozen of these uh, guideline notes have been produced to harmonize the approaches to uh, cyber criminality. S Budapest Convention also contains, as a treaty, two protocols uh, to it. One dealing with the counteraction uh, against racism and xenophobia committed through computer systems, as well as uh, on matters of enhanced cooperation and disclosure of electronic evidence, which actually strongly facilitates interaction between the states in, in counteracting cybercrime. So it's a strong platform of cooperation between states on counteracting cybercrime. And it is actually um, a strong uh, possibility uh, to enhance uh, and facilitate criminal investigation and proceedings through use and exchange of evidence available with this crime. Indeed, um, there has been a lot of criticism of uh, the Budapest Convention initially, and the criticism itself largely relied uh, on the idea that not all of the offenses were originally covered, but we can already see that the additional protocol of 2003 relating to racism and xenophobia committed through computer systems is an important development in, in this sense. And there are many more elements which are being um, studied and developed under the auspices of the Budapest Convention. I think in a sense, uh, the discussions at the UN level at this stage uh, for a broader UN Cybercrime Convention, they went into impasse and Originally, there was a proposal in 2010 at the UN Crime Co Congress held in Brazil as regards uh, establishing of such convention, but I think we're still far from uh, uh, developments in this area. Now, as regards the instruments uh, and measures targeting cybercrime, I think we can mark certain of these uh, actually uh, instruments and measures uh, targeting cybercrime. 
already from the available Budapest uh, framework uh, of the convention proposed by the Council of Europe. But I think um, the one of the most complex elements in relation to uh, preventive measures and investigatory or prosecutorial measures is actually um, a complexity of obtaining, and I would probably single it out, of obtaining electronic evidence that may be stored in foreign multiple shifting or unknown jurisdictions. Uh, it's, it's actually a problem of limitation of law enforcement by territorial boundaries. And I think the second protocol to the Budapest Convention actually responds uh, to this difficulty to a certain extent. Um, it, it provides for tools for enhanced cooperation and disclosure of electronic evidence. And that's something that actually helps in a sense with um, prosecutorial measures that are mentioned here. But again, I think more generally, there are many examples of effective preventive measures that I mentioned here and international cooperation measures related to evidence exchanges and uh, measures relating to coordinated um, um, counteraction uh, against cybercrime, which which are visible from the activities of, for instance, Eurojust, Eurojust or uh, the joint investigation teams established under the auspices of various um, European structures. So if we look at the cybercrime itself, I think uh, the developments that have occurred recently, they, they allow to say that there has been quite a lot done in relation to preventive measures, prosecutorial measures, international cooperation measures. But again, if we look at the issue of addressing the cybercrime, and it is very much different from the um, how we would address the cyber warfare, I think there are elements which I refer to here that, that are of importance in this sense. And actually, in this sense, the cyber crime very much differs from cyber warfare because the perpetrator is regularly the state itself. Then, of course, we can speak about the conduct of private or oh, privately undertaken cyber acts of war that in many instances could still be attributable to states. Uh, and then it's, it's actually the difficulty that relates to investigation and prosecution of su such uh, cyber war crimes that might be seen to be more direct in a situation that I have mentioned where the uh, activities of cyber warfare are very much centralized. But it might be also very complicated in, in, in a situation of decentralized cyber warfare. And there are many examples of actually from, from from the events in Ukraine, where we see the emerging uh, majority of uh, cyber attacks or cyber threats uh, coming from pro-Russian hacktivists, for instance, that actively fall under the umbrella of Killnet, uh, the Nexus. Uh, the, the Killnet itself, the, such organizations as Anonymous Russia, Anonymous Sudan, infinity hackers which which are kind of centralized in their activities and that produce as it is it has been reported for more than 50 percent of all pro-russian hacktivist activities tracked uh, by by some reporters so i think it, it it's different in this sense but it is also different on the level of targets of such uh, cyber warfare i think the the targets of this cyber warfare are regularly the Ukrainian state authorities. Uh, in some instances, these are uh, actually entities that uh, facilitate or ensure uh, international support for Ukraine. So these could be not necessarily the, the public entities, but also non-governmental organizations, civil society. And actually, the cyber operations at this point are not only aimed at 
creating uh, cyber havoc, but also they are aimed at uh, a certain degree of misinformation and disinformation that also uh, sort of uh, questions the whole need for support to Ukraine in the West. And in some instances, these are aimed at providing and ensuring domestic support in Russia for the continued war. I think in this sense, the what is in, it is interesting what the Budapest uh, Convention has provided as a part of a platform of assistance to Ukraine. Uh, it has actually through some of its activities like Cyber East and with the assistance of the European Union, it has uh, provided um, assistance uh, to amend the domestic uh, criminal law in Ukraine to increase the effectiveness of criminal justice action against cyber attacks. So these are properly criminalized. It provides supported training to OSINT investigations, which have been mentioned in collection and gathering of electronic evidence in war crime proceedings. It actually reviews and assisted, provided assistance in reviewing the legislation as regards the OSINT investigations and criminal proceedings to allow such evidence to be admissible in court and eventually uh, it provided various types of trainings uh, as a part of the assistance to Ukraine on ransomware offenses, uh, which are uh, kind of um, being on the, uh, on the rise in relation to the current cyber threats vis-a-vis -vis Ukraine and actually vis-a-vis -vis its partners as well. What is interesting, and I'm mentioning it here, that um, I think uh, cyber, uh, space is being used not only for uh, threatening action against Ukraine and public authorities and civil society and NGOs, but also that there are some tools available for the civil society and uh, engage uh, in collection of electronic evidence that are very prominent. And I just wanted to mention in this sense such an initiative as Berkeley Protocol on Digital Open Source Investigations that was published uh, recently with the assistance of the uh, UN Office of the High Commissioner on Human Rights. Now, if we turn into the issue of uh, actually privacy and access to information, I think there are two elements here, and I would not go into much of a detail that I wanted to mention that, of course, uh, the cyber criminality and counteracting cyber criminality, counteracting cyber warfare requires action on behalf of the state that uh, actually limits the right to privacy and limits the access to information. This is quite an inevitable action that is stemming from the uh, situation at hand and the national security and public safety demands. But of course, uh, there is quite an extensive case law of the European Court of Human Rights, uh, where, which speaks for necessity to regulate, for instance, the data collection and data retention uh, through law with requirement of proportionality being in place and necessary safeguards against arbitrariness uh, to be put in place. So uh, indeed, the protection against cybercrime and cyber warfare might uh, lead to limitation of access to information and uh, actually counteracting false information. This information might lead to such limitations, but indeed, these limitations should still be acceptable from the point of view of the requirements of both Articles 8 and Article 10 of the European Convention on Human Rights that provide for protection of privacy and right of access to information. What is interesting is, and I have mentioned this in context of Budapest Convention, there are some new elements that appear in the case law of the European Court of Human Rights that remain at this stage not touched upon by the Budapest Convention regulations that, that relate, for instance, to new cyber threats. And I'm mentioning here the threat of domestic cyber violence. Uh, actually, quite an interesting discussion on, on how 
and what kind of requirements in relation to domestic cyber violence uh, should be put in place uh, as regards counteracting it as another cyber threat. Now, if we look at the probably final elements of the discussion and coming to an end, I think it's a list of questions that I have largely relating to cyber warfare. Maybe these would inspire uh, some of discussions. Um, and that is based on actually something that I was looking at while preparing for this event. I think um, once again, when we look into international law regulation uh, of uh, cyber warfare or illegal cyber war, I think we can say that the acts of cyber warfare, they can fall within the ambit of international humanitarian law. And that means actually that a number of these acts based on the targets and the results of interference, uh, uh, the results of interference and the chain of events that these interference interferences can lead to, they actually amount to, uh, again, to, to, to kinetic war if, if they are compared in this sense. And indeed, the principles of international humanitarian law are applicable in, in such a situation to cyber warfare. Um, I think what we can see in context of Ukraine and cyber warfare against Ukraine, that cyber warfare goes along the lines of classical warfare with major aim at targeting state infrastructure, uh, the aim of seeding chaos, panic, and terror, mainly targeting civilian infrastructure and civilians, uh, then uh, kind of suggestion or uh, development of propaganda and psycho operations uh, that can be seen as forms of cybercrime because these are images and information which is disseminated through um, social media networks and via, um, again, the information technologies. We can also see specific threats of, uh, in this sense, of uh, and use of uh, cyber tools in relation to conflict-based sexual violence. Uh, there are some elements of discussion in this sex, uh, sense also as regards the um, trafficking in human beings with the use of electronic tools which are covered by another body of the Council of Europe um, which is uh, dealing with the issues of traf trafficking in human beings and again the issues of spread of propaganda and misinformation disinformation I think all of these are uh, specific to Ukraine and we can see that uh, there are many of these questions that from a practical point of view remain unanswered yet but these are kind of clear from the point of view of legal regulation at least at this stage for me that indeed acts of cyber warfare are covered by the provisions of international humanitarian law and once again they can be prosecuted in the same way as the classical war crimes uh, could be prosecuted. And that's finally a, disc a, a sort of the wrap up of what I was trying to produce to you today. I hope uh, it was uh, actually useful for, and it is useful for our discussion. I think one can argue and one can conclude that the cybercrime methods that have developed from an individual action into the actions used by states or affiliate groups in cyber warfare, they need a separate response or a new response from the point of view of international law to fill out the accountability gap. I think it is quite important that cyber warfare must be addressed via international criminal law in a centralized way. And it seems like from the review that I had that 
only fragmented transnational criminal justice efforts by separate states are not sufficient in this respect uh, in, in this uh, respect and a collective response is is quite required to address the illegal cyber warfare there is also a need for general international law tools uh, to prosecute certain forms of illegal actions with the use of IT tools, computers, and systems. And these tools, uh, such as notions uh, classifying certain types of cyber warfare, should be flexible enough to accommodate new, new cyber threats, such as the potential use of artificial intelligence. And I think in this sense, some generic definitions and guides should be elaborated similar to those under the Budapest Convention permitting a wider safety net. I think in this sense I have also mentioned the rules of accountability and state responsibility. They are of importance from the international law point of view and I think they should be applied to uh, lead to international responsibility of states for damage and illegal acts caused by cyber warfare and such responsibility should be imminent and no impunity should persist uh, from the point of view of damage caused uh, by such an illegal acts of cyber warfare and that's probably a conclusion that I would like to come on to and I would like to switch off the sharing of the presentation and thank you for your attention would we'll be ready to reply to your questions thank you so much because we are running out of time i will open the uh, q a session to everyone and i will invite everyone to raise their hands and uh, ask the questions if we can take about three questions from the audience thank you Question on the, on the first presentation, there was a very interesting statistic that you passed over from Nord's security but didn't discuss, which is the decrease in breaches in Ukraine, but the huge increase in Russia. Could you um, address that? Uh, I know there's probably not that much known, but where are they coming from and how many are from state actors? Uh, well. And I'm always, I, I gotta admit, since I, USAID is very uncomfortable in the cybersecurity sphere, and they have uh, 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 stopped my uh, publication of materials on offensive by Ukraine cybersecurity activities, so I'm always hesitant to discuss, but, but and so I had hoped to just kind of put it in there as a uh, side note. But I will say that, uh, you know, it's, it's both, basically, because, for, first of all, it's very big, like Russia's. Uh, you know, there's a cyber army in Ukraine. Do we count that as government? Do we count that as volunteers? Uh, you know, it's hacktivists, right? I, I think in the second presentation, the, the term hacktivist was used. I, I personally believe that, uh, uh, you know, certainly from Russia, but increasingly from Ukraine, they're closely connected to the government. So how we outline them, it's kind of hard. There, there were freelancers. Uh, that have, I think, faded a little bit in the, on the attacks on Ukraine. Um, Anonymous, in particular, was a very active in the beginning. Uh, and so I personally don't know about successful breaches and, and, and who was more successful. I think most of these, again, are, are more DDoS style uh, that you see a lot of. Uh, they, you know, Russian television has several times broadcast speeches from Ukraine when uh, things got switched through uh, hackers. Uh, it's it's definitely um, it's definitely something where I'm waiting for a definitive report on that from from an academic or a practitioner. I haven't personally seen it, and unfortunately, um, I know it's not a fruitful area for me to pursue, so I kind of avoided it. I hope that non-answer <laughs> satisfies. Satisfies you. I'm sorry, my question is going to be difficult, but I need to ask that. Um, when Russian sponsored AI companies get hired in the United States by. Uh, I'm so sorry. <coughs> Can you hear us? Can you hear that, Pop? 
So, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's a little bit distant in the voice. Now it's better. Okay. Um, so when uh, U.S. states hire Russian AI companies like Toloka AI, which is completely owned by Yandex, which is uh, Putler's own company, and nothing getting done, and not only that, but American University, for example, yesterday, Northeastern University, and I spoke with a professor who invited them, and she said, well, now they are considered refugees, and therefore we can't discriminate, and we ran it by our law department at the university. Whose responsibility do you think it is to stop the Russian AI companies that are controlled by Putler? I'm sorry, and who... Uh... I'll go with Pablo. Okay, <laughs> Pablo, do you want to answer the question? I I just I don't understand really the the content uh, of the question. Is it is it rather a statement or a question? Because uh, can I can I clarify? Because please. I want us to 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 be on the same page. Uh, as far as I understand, here we have different understanding of responsibilities that um, countries and governments bear, and then private companies. And with the war in Ukraine, we we see how. Uh, important is the collaboration, as you mentioned, between public and private companies. But then we also have some private companies in the United States, right? That um, no, the, the, the company is not in the United States. But I'm sorry. Toloka AI is not in the United States. It's a fully subsidiary of Yandex, which is one of the Putler's companies, and yet American states are hiring it for AI. Okay. As, a, as a state governments, and I'm curious whose responsibility it is to stop that type of thing. And I will also add, maybe, if you have any ideas about international measures that can be taken to basically um, prevent countries like Russia and other autocratic regimes uh, from, uh, even though we do know, I want to make it very clear that those countries are not members of the Council of Europe. Russia was a, uh, was, was a member, and then Council of Europe is the first international organization which expelled Russia once it started the war. So we have those countries which are not members of the international community, so they no longer follow, follow the internationally recognized principles and rights. So, Pablo, do you have any ideas as to what uh, measures at international level can be adopted to uh, hold these countries accountable or their private companies accountable for the breaches they may make? Yeah, I think it's it's one of the most complex questions that one can ask. If you, I mean, if you look at an inverse side of the question, uh, for instance, if you read reports from Google and Microsoft on what was done to counteract cyber threats and cyber warfare against Ukraine. Actually, you can see that the the Microsoft and Google, they are very much uh, working against the, the straight threats uh, of cyber warfare, uh, actually supporting the Ukrainian authorities in this sense and critical infrastructure and, and analyzing the threats that emerge uh, it, it's very interesting in this sense because eventually, and that's something what Robert said, maybe it's interesting uh, for Robert to comment as well, in a sense, if you have software which is produced by private entities, which is used by the government and the infrastructure of the government, uh, eventually you the, the companies that produce this software and the systems for use, the computers, um, the IT infrastructure, they are obliged to be engaged with the, the product they have provided for use by the governmental authorities. And actually, in this sense, if you look at the attacks on the power grids, or if you look at the attacks on the critical infrastructure points, it seems like it's inevitable that the company that services these products will be there. Yeah, so uh, that, that's a part of the obligation. So in this sense, the attack against the, the states and public infrastructure is also an attack against the products 
developed by by the the companies that service uh, this critical infrastructure and and in inverse uh, sense uh, if you look at the analysis produced by the uh, microsoft and others as regards the structure of uh, cyber threats coming from um uh, against actually ukraine in this sense it, it's more centralized that there are i mean it's basically quasi military entities that are engaged in these uh, um, activities and, and that's 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 uh, i think much easier to define as as something attributable so maybe robert would also want to to comment on this well i mean i guess i I was thinking that Yandex was already sanctioned by the United States, but I'm not certain on that. Uh, are they sanctioned? They are under sanctions. No, they are sanctioned. What? They're fully subsidiary whose founder never had another job other than at Yandex is still allowed to sell the AI software, which is collecting, I guarantee you, spy information yeah. on American citizens and state is used by the state governments in the United States, which is why I was asking the question. Yeah. No, I mean, in the, I, well, I can say one thing. I know the Department of Treasury is uh, hiring nine sanctions uh, employees specifically towards cybersecurity uh, sort of sanctions, which is new. You know, we're, we're trying to do this for the first time, the Office of Foreign Assets Control. Uh, and so I think that this is, your question is one that we'll be dealing with for sure, of exactly how we, uh, it's not an easy question because I'm sure that there's many steps, you know, in, in ownership and, so um, it will keep uh, law school graduates busy for quite a while. <laughs> I know that we have run out of time, but if um, there is anyone else who wants to ask the final question, or do we have a question online that... I welcome yeah. folks who have any lingering questions to stay within the room, um, but we are going to now end the event. Um, but again, thank you all so much for joining us today. I'm going to hand it back to Marta to wrap up the show. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much. Um, so. First and foremost, thank you so much to Rob and Pablo for their excellent presentation. I'm very, very happy that we collaborated today on the very important issue for Ukraine, but I also believe for other countries as well. I wanted to make very clear for everyone what my main lesson learned from the cybersecurity situation is that everyone bears responsibility, even though governments and private companies will bear the most. There is a role to play for everyone and it must be a, collector, a collective endeavor. So when it comes, um, when the war started, we all Ukrainians received um, different type of messages, emails from our government saying that we must adopt basic security measures, including anti-virus programs uh, to always remember about software updates. To, even though it's annoying to uh, use multi-factor uh, authentication that Rob was telling us about. Those basic things can actually prevent 90% of cyber incidents. And I want all of us to start thinking about what we can do and uh, create this uh, new mindset of people that it's up to us to first think about cybersecurity. And then I am convinced that this will help with deterrence strategy because we all want to make for the attackers to to for all of the attacks that they may think to conduct to be more complex, more risky, more expensive. Um, so I just want all of us to think about today. We you made the first um, step of being more aware about the situation that is currently is. So I, I'm very thankful, but also think about other measures that you can adopt personally, and then how we can also motivate our governments to do more. So I, I just want to thank you very much, our speakers, and then a big shout out to the incredible BKC community, especially Lise and especially Xia. They put so much effort into this event. I can't be more grateful. And also to Becca and to Patrick um, and to the entire BKC as well. So thank you. Have a great day. And I hope you enjoyed it. Pablo, thank you so, so much. <laughs>